everybody, it's me, Lady Ada, and I'm here at Espressif DevCon. I want to talk a little bit about some of the work that Adafruit uh, and all of its amazing team members have been working on over the last few years uh, using ESP Espressif chips, uh, and also some of the stuff that Adafruit's been selling and how and why we've been doing CircuitPython, which is the topic of today's little chit chat uh, that we've recorded here. Um, what Adafruit's done for the last like 15 years is sell a lot of open source hardware. That means that I design circuit boards using Espressif chips, for example, and then uh, we sell the assembled boards, tested, ready to go with documentation. We also release firmware, software, and hardware under open source licenses, uh, usually MIT or BSD license, so people can take that code, that hardware, remix it, and reuse it into their own products or projects. Um, this is great for the engineering and development community because they get a little bit of a head start. They have known working schematic, known working code. And as we'll see, um, there's actually quite a bit of the pieces and parts that make up CircuitPython that even if you're not using CircuitPython, you might be interested in as a developer of ESP, IDF, um, or Arduino, or MicroPython. So I thought we'd first start off with just talking a little bit about um, how we got to CircuitPython, because I think it's an interesting story. A lot of people are like, why why do we need interpreted languages? Isn't assembly good enough? Like, why don't we just write everything in Tensilica or ESP IDF or whatever low-level code? And I think one thing that's interesting to remember is that when the first Espressive chips hit the maker developer market, not just the Wi-Fi chips you know, that were meant to be used uh, in a Linux system, but actually like development boards, um, the ESP01 and the ESP8266 modules, um, they often came with either AT firmware, which meant that you would control the, the ESP chip itself as a Wi-Fi coprocessor. You'd send it commands like, you know, AT, Wi-Fi connect, you know, AT, socket open, etc., and you would connect to a, a Wi-Fi website, a, a website. Uh, you would be able to send and receive data. You could even set up a little server. Um, open up sockets, UDP, TCP, etc. And then, you know, people started with that. And we actually had a couple of guides showing how people could use something like an Arduino Uno, connect over serial to an Espressive chip to, you know, the wider world for Wi-Fi. It was extremely affordable. And then what we saw actually, which is a little interesting, is um, some folks, I, I'm, I'm assuming that they were at Espressive, but to be honest, I, sh I should have looked this up before I did this video. They ported the Lua scripting language to the ESP8266. And this was really interesting because the 8266, you know, is this Wi-Fi co Wi -Fi processor. Uh, it has the radio built in, but it also had enough RAM and flash built in memory to be able to run a scripting language. Like, yes, you could write code in C or you know in Arduino E's, but there is some there was some benefit to Lua, which is a scripting language that's often used by game developers to like automate and, and run within their games engine. But it was you know it's a scripting language that allows you to write code quickly. Um, the script is run within the virtual machine that's running on the ESP8266. And I think the having Lua available was what kind of prompted a lot of people to think about, oh, what if we used interpreted languages instead of just compiled languages like C or Rust or, you know, Assembler or C++ or, you know, whatever your, your favorite compiled language is. Um, so in 2016, we saw a Kickstarter by uh, Damien George, who is the author of MicroPython, and uh, he had been working on MicroPython, you know, a small microcontroller-based Python interpreter for the STM32 series chips. And the STM32 series were, you know, of course, uh, Cortex chips. Um, but he was really interested in this idea of the, the 8266 being available, has Wi-Fi, and how this could really be a powerful way to introduce interpreted Python on a microcontroller while also bringing in IoT. And for reasons I'll show later, it's a really, really good match. So when he did this Kickstarter, first off, a lot of people got very excited. It got a lot of funding. Um, and, uh, you know, we chatted with Damien and actually contributed, uh, not just by funding him, but also uh, we wrote a whole bunch of tutorials and guides for MicroPython. Um, 
and because we thought it was really neat to see like okay you've got this powerful chip it's so powerful that maybe you have a little bit of extra processing time and speed and you know it's interpreted so it's slower but maybe it's okay maybe you're not cpu bound as much or memory bound having that run on esp8266 so we actually ended up writing um, a bunch of tutorials and a bunch of guides and a bunch of libraries for MicroPython. People still use them for the 8266. And, um, you know, that was super cool and great for a very long time. Uh, and we still think it's, you know, MicroPython is definitely a, a really good alternative to CircuitPython. It's, CircuitPython is not meant to replace MicroPython. They live side by side. The goal of CircuitPython is to make things easier for beginners because we have a lot of customers who are students or they're beginning engineers or they just want to get started really fast. And so our goal is to make things really, really easy and unified, um, have the same code run under C Python as CircuitPython. All platforms should have the same API. So a couple of these engineering decisions that we made were incompatible with MicroPython. And this is why we ended up going with uh, CircuitPython. We renamed it because we didn't want to cause any confusion. That said, uh, we still commit code to mainline MicroPython through pull requests and vice versa. We, we like to keep up um, and we collaborate all the time on stuff like async IO is one of the um, ways to do asynchronous, not threaded, but you know, m multiple threads of control type um, computation on CircuitPython, MicroPython. It's something that uh, we chat with MicroPython to collaborate with. So, you know, one of the questions that you know we do get a lot you know is like why why would you want to have an interpreted language or you're, you're going to be using so much more power you're going to be using so much more memory and i guess for us or at least for me um i've spent a lot of my life in tool chains i have like you know this windows computer here and it's got like eight thousand tool chains installed on it from ti from stm from atmel microchip um, from Espressif, you know, multiple versions of the IDF, Arduino, multiple versions. And when I think about when I started with electronics, the way you would program, I, I programmed PIC microcontrollers. And a lot of people watching this probably started with these early microcontrollers. Um, flash memory wasn't yet affordable, so they were UVEE prom programmable. And so whenever you wanted to write code, which was often in assembler or in a very, very low level C, you would have to write your code, you'd, you'd compile it into a binary, which didn't take that long, but then to upload the code, you'd have to like literally remove the chip from your board. You'd put it in a UV eraser, you'd wait 10 minutes, take it out, and now it's erased, and then you could program it with your code and then you'd test it. So every cycle of compilation and testing took 10, 15 minutes. And if you tried to rush through the UV process, if folks remember, you'd end up not actually erasing the whole chip. You'd have to kind of start over because it wouldn't verify right. So one of the things that was really nice about moving from UV to flash to um, bootloader type development, like such as with Arduino, is that that cycle of coding, compiling, upload, testing, debugging is getting faster and faster and faster. What was 10 minutes, 15 minutes with UVE proms, once you got to flash, okay, maybe it's two to three minutes. And then, you know, and you'd have to physically maybe do some connecting or bootloading. When then with Arduino, with auto reset, and auto bootloading, you know, maybe it would be even faster. It would be 30 seconds to a minute. And that really sped up the ability for people to learn and iterate on their designs. However, um, and I think, you know, this is something that people who work with the ESP IDF know, even with um, Ninja and really fast make files and configurations, it still does take quite a while to compile code and then upload that to Flash. I mean, Flash memory, it actually becomes a little bit of your time bound because you have to erase blocks and then that takes time and then you have to, you know, reprogram the blocks. So unless you have some sort of really cool, like, you know, mapped memory flash, like your code goes into a section and you don't have to erase the whole thing, it still does take quite a bit of time to do a development cycle. Um, even if your compilation is now optimized, which I know people have been working a lot on and I, I commend them, it's much, much faster to compile code for Espressif than, it, um, than many other platforms. But that said, what if instead of 30 seconds, it was two seconds? What if it was like 
instant? What if it was something you could do from your web browser? What if it was something you didn't even have to install a tool chain for? And that's kind of the goal of CircuitPython is, yes, you're going to be a little slower. Yes, it's going to take more memory. Um, yes, if you want optimized, you know, very speedy parts, you have to write that in C and you have to kind of build it into CircuitPython, which I'll show uh, later. But if you're doing prototyping development or you just need a very fast cycle of iteration, um, especially I've noticed with doing robotics, anything when you have to do heuristics or calibration or customization or user, user interfaces, that fast iteration cycle in CircuitPython is like really joyful compared to the compile, upload, erase flash, program flash, open up your terminal, debug. So um, we're gonna go look at that process. I also wanna just show really fast some of the hardware. So let's uh, go to the overhead and I'll just quickly show off some boards just so people know what we're talking about. Um, so this is, you know, Featherboard ESP8266 and ESP32, people really like these. And then, you know, we've now got boards that have built-in screens on them. This is at ESP uh, S2. Uh, this is a board that has a uh, built-in battery and ESP S2. And then on the top, there's an e-ink display. Um, this is another ESP32, you know, classic, not the S series. Uh, we also have S3 and C3 um, in addition. So let's now, uh, now that we've introduced everything, we've just explained what we're going, uh, what we're going to do. Let's actually show what it's like to use CircuitPython on the uh, Feather ESP32 and ESP32 S2. Okay, so. Everything that you need to play around with CircuitPython is available on circuitpython.org. That is the website that uh, I'm at right now. Um, and, you know, we have uh, tutorials linked from here, but most people want to get started uh, immediately by going to the downloads page. And the download page has uh, 340 different boards, um, and not just stuff from Adafruit. We support all sorts of makers. Anyone can submit a PR to add support for their board and the, the board definition, you just need to have your own USB VID and PID. Um, the board that we're going to be playing with today is the ESP32 S2 uh, TFT, which is this one. Um, and we have usually a stable release and you know, like kind of a cutting edge release. Right now we're working on CircuitPython 8.00, which is like our big espressive release. Uh, we're adding a lot more board for, a lot more support for ESP32 boards, including the classic ESP32. Um, you can download either binary, which is, you know, you, you would burn that directly with ESP tool, or you can download a UF2. So, a UF2 is a file format that we really like to use that is compatible with mass storage bootloaders. So if we go to uh, the overhead real fast, I'll show off the mass storage uh, bootloader. Because the ESP32 S2 has native USB, which I think is amazing, and so does the S3, um, there is the ROM bootloader, and then on top of that we install uh, what we call the UF2 bootloader. And the UF2 bootloader takes advantage of the mass storage interface over native USB to allow you to drag and drop a file. Why? Because there's actually a lot of people for whom installing ESP tool is a bit of a struggle, um, especially if you have an older Mac and the Python is 2.7 and it's it got to install Homebrew. Basically, it's like if you can get them to run uh, the teeny UF2 bootloader, um, it's very easy to upload new code. You just double click the reset button um, and drag a file on. So if you go to the computer, um, the file, the, the computer, sorry, the, the feather now shows up as a disk drive. Um, it contains current UF2, which is the current firmware, index HTML, which if you double click, it will take you to um, the page and then info UF2, which tells you, you know, what version you're running. Um, of the, the teeny few UF2 bootloader. And then I can just take that file, hold on. I can take that UF2 file, I just drag it on, and then uh, it'll burn the bootloader. It takes some time, you know, it's, it's erasing the flash and reprogramming it. And then when the board comes up, which it will in a moment, it shows up as a disk drive called CircuitPy. So if you look on 
my computer. There's one disk drive here called CircuitPy. Again, taking advantage of native USB. Um, you might be wondering, well, this native USB stuff is really cool. What if I want to do it? Well, uh, TDUF2 is a uh, USB um, low level stack that is completely open source and runs on a variety of different processors, including Espressif. Espressif uses it in the ESP IDF. So MIDI, uh, somebody actually just added U2F, um, mass storage, CDC, HID, host if the uh, chip supports it, all that stuff. Um, there's example code in the TNUF2, uh, uh, TNUF2 and TNUSB uh, GitHub repos. Uh, TNUSB is the underlying USB stack. TNUF2 is the UF2 mass storage bootloader built on top of TNUSB. Um, and this is uh, developed by TAC, who is uh, an Adafruit uh, developer. So uh, even if you don't use CircuitPython, please do check it out because it's a really awesome USB stack. It's one of the only ones I know that is completely open source, freely licensed, and available for multiple processors. Okay, back to our CircuitPy drive. So, um, again, for usability, one of the things that we really like is having the uh, storage for code and files and accessories and everything you need for your development as mass storage. You know why? Because mass storage is the most universal USB interface. Um, everything supports it, including you know Android, Chromebooks, old Macs, new Macs, Linux, Windows. Um, even CDC can sometimes USB CDC uh, for serial command control. Sometimes you do need a driver on some computers, but mass storage, mass storage is forever, and so it makes it really a, a great way to make sure that no matter what platform people are running they don't need to have any special tool chains because you can just double click the code.py file um, and then edit it directly. So I'm going to uh, you know, open this in Atom. So uh, because the ESP um, chip has native USB, it has multiple endpoints, we actually show up as a composite device. We have mass storage, Again, HID and MIDI as optional, and then uh, CDC for the REPL. The REPL is the interface to the Python um, virtual machine. You can run commands within um, the REPL. So, you know, I can, common one is you just type in one plus one, and it's like two. Um, or, you know, you can uh, import a library, and then you can do, you know, what's in that library. And then you can say, oh, what's the OSU name? You know, and it's like here's here's info about your board, so you can you know you can use the REPL to play around with. I don't I, I think it's good for just very basic like how do you index within an array, you know, and then you know you want to try built in um, functions within Python like oh what's this you know math command for exponentials or whatever. Um, but for the most part, what you're going to do is put your code in the code.py file. And Scott, who's the lead developer um, for CircuitPython, and so came, you know, came up with all the API and interface decisions, a lot of which were based on usability, had this idea, which, um, which at first I was a little bit shocked by, and he said, oh, I want to make it so whenever you save the code.py file, it will rerun the virtual machine. And I was like, that goes against everything I know as an engineer, but okay, let's try it. And actually, it's kind of cool. So what it means is that I can um, really quickly do development. So like, you know, I already have this example code ready to go. Um, I have a code.py file with a bunch of code in it, and I'm just going to, I'm going to drag and drop all the files, and then, you know, we can go through the details behind them later. Um, so to put your code and your assets, library files, fonts, images, um, hold on. Uh, you know, whatever uh, accessories you need for your code, you just copy it on uh, over mass storage. And then later I'll show what you do if you are like, what if I have a chip that doesn't have native USB, like the original ESP32? Uh, don't worry, that's that's also possible. Okay, so let's replace all the files. And this is using the built-in four megabytes of SPI flash. We partition it out so you have, you know, some of it's for firmware, some of it's for over the air, and then we have like a megabyte or so available for code. So uh, let's close this and open the code. Um, 
this is the code I'm running. So, you know, there's all sorts of libraries you want to install, SSL and Wi-Fi and display support. Um, you know, one thing that's uh, kind of neat is, um, if we go to the overhead real fast, the REPL, if you have a computer, if you have a mic controller board with a built-in TFT, you can actually, uh, you know, as I'm typing into the REPL, hello, hello, um, you know, the, the, the same output echoes on the TFT. So you, it can be nice for debugging. You can see like what you're doing. Um, all right, so let's go back to the uh, computer. Uh, so in my code, I'm, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to the GitHub API uh, over HTTPS. Um, you know, having TLS 1.2 support is really awesome in the ESP32. Um, and it will load up a bitmap and it will load up a font. This is one of the things that was really powerful about CircuitPython. Things like, I just want to display a bitmap or I want to parse a PCF standard format font and use it for my UI it's trivial and it's built into CircuitPython. We kind of like to have as much stuff built in for these kinds of advanced um, graphical interfaces. I also have like audio playback built in, stuff like that with like wave playback. It'll connect to uh, the SSID, which is defined in a different file called secrets.py. You know, we like to have the configuration in different files so that people don't commit both files if they're working on it. You know, obviously you don't want to have uh, your SSID, your passwords, or your you know GitHub token uh, mixed in with the code, but it's very easy to load as a separate file um, off of the file system, and then uh, it can uh, open up a socket pool, create an SSL context, and then use requests, which is a very standard Python uh, library that's actually originally was written for C Python on desktops, but we kind of made a very lightweight version that runs on microcontrollers that can um, use authorization tokens if you want to. It can, it can do, um, it can add in stuff into the request sort of like curl to authenticate you or set, uh, you know, permissions or, you know, what have you, if you have to send tokens back and forth. And then what's really neat is that um, JSON parsing is built into uh, CircuitPython. And it's also, you know, stuff like string parsing and error handling and um, dealing with, you know, binary hex data, and then you have to parse it. All that stuff that's really, really frustrating to do in C and C++. Like I, I know it's possible to parse JSON or CSV files, but I just really hate doing it in C. It's always, you know, either you're doing it by hand and you're kind of stumbling around, or you're doing it with a library and it's like this massive thing. And then, you know, even then, um, you know, one wrong comma or wrong quote, you know, you, you'll never figure out what the issue is, whereas the built-in JSON parser we have in CircuitPython is, is really reliable. Uh, you get the JSON and then you just, uh, you know, I can even, I'll show after um, I get this running, you could print out the JSON and then I can print to the text REPL the output and then display on the display the string, the text. So this is going to look at the number of stars that we have on the CircuitPython repo. So what's nice is that I just hit Control D in the REPL and you'll see it's going to connect to the internet. It gets an IP address. It fetches the JSON. It has the display. Um, it shows me the number on the screen. And if I go to the overhead, it'll show the number of stars. So yeah, that's a project I already had ready to go. And so Again, the power is now I want to um, really quickly iterate. So let's show what it's like to quickly iterate. So let's go to the uh, computer. So first up, um, you know, I was connecting to the Adafruit repo, but I actually want to do Espressif ESP IDF instead. And then second, uh, you know, and I can, I can save this and it immediately starts running. So while it's running, I can also say, well, you know, um, I have uh, this background image is what I'm displaying, but I actually want to uh, display this background instead because of course it's no longer displaying the circuit Python demo. So you know, the first uh, change ran already and it says, okay, yeah, the number of stars for this repo is 9,000 something, cool. Let's change the background. 
So I'm going to save that. It's going to rerun immediately. And then if we go to the overhead, you'll see the graphics has instantaneously changed. And uh, the reason you're actually not seeing the text is because it's white. So, uh, oops, bug, let's go fix it real fast. On the code uh, over here, we're gonna make a text label. Uh, let's make it red instead. And then let's also change a different font. I've got the impact font. So I'll change the font. And then when we rerun it and go to the overhead, you'll see this time my live demo shows the text. Now, of course, I can now, you know, the text is in the wrong location. I can tweak the X and Y coordinate. But you see how fast it is. It's like the code, once I've got it, I can make four or five changes in about uh, 30 seconds and instantly see the output. So that's the goal of CircuitPython, to make that iteration cycle so fast, it's actually enjoyable to code. Okay, finally, we're gonna look at what happens if you don't have native USB and you don't have a display. Of course, it's a lot easier to do Wi-Fi development if you've got all that file dragging and dropping. Uh, for the uh, CircuitPython 8.00 release, one of the things that we've added is this Wi-Fi web workflow. So this is an ESP32, the classic, does not have native USB and it doesn't have a display on this feather. So let's go to the computer. Um, so for this board, we do, we do have a download for it and you'll notice that CircuitPython 7 is available because this is new with 8. You download a bin file because again, there's no TDUF2 drag and drop bootloader. And then you'll use the um, ESP Web Flasher, which is written by uh, Melissa here at Adafruit, which allows you to use web serial to upload code. Um, and it's basically like ESP tool, but in the browser for Chromium browsers. And then once you've uploaded it, you can also configure the Wi-Fi SSID. Um, and what's really neat is you can then go to HTTP uh, colon slash slash circuitpython.local and this will show up. This is running on the CircuitPython board itself. It has a little miniature web server that allows you to uh, first off get information about the board and what the IP address is. And then there's a built-in, again, very simple serial terminal. So I can uh, type in commands, which you can see now scrolling past my screen. And then um, there's also a file browser that you can use for, again, very basic, you know, you want to upload files and you want to, um, you know, say open your code.py and see what code is inside of there. Um, but if you want to do some real development, we also have a web-based uh, full code editor. And uh, the full code editor, it, you know, it connects to your computer uh, via sockets, web, uh, web sockets. You can open up your code.py file, um, you know, it's got hello world here, but let's say I want to uh, have some NeoPixels going on. I will copy and paste this code, save this as code.py, and it uploads the code to the ESP32 Feather, and then, let me, hold on, let me kick it. When you restart it, when we go to the overhead, you'll see flaking NeoPixels. So, um, you know, file management and serial terminal and code running, all that you can still do with the CDC port that you've got. But if you want to like not have to muck around with uh, using a special IDE, you can use our web-based Wi-Fi serial interface. So I think this will still make it really easy for people even if you don't have native USB, which we do like, but there's still thousands of people with the classic ESP32, which we want to support. So that's kind of an introduction to CircuitPython, the ESP32, um, S2, S3, C3, and the native are supported. Um, I think it's a really great match. The ESP32 is so powerful. IoT, I think is a great match for CircuitPython. Um, this is a great way to get started with development if you've never done IoT development. And this is a great way to iterate your design before you go into production.